It's hard to believe it's been over three whole months since those monsters came to town. If only I had known back then what they were really doing here. Maybe I could have stopped it. I don't know. So much of this is beyond me. What could I have done? Even if I had known about it, could I have stopped what happened to all those people? Sickness, sarcasm, the SCP Foundation. It's all such a blur, but for a while, I can still remember how I spent 100 days infiltrating a Sarkic cult. It all began on a pretty ordinary day. I live in a small lumber town. Most of the area is cut off from major cities, connected only by miles and miles of winding road through the forest. It's a quiet rural place and a low-tech way of life. Our main business has been timber, generations of tree cutters. Even in the modern age, we keep that going. Although my home has always been off the beaten track, we often had our fair share of visitors. Hikers and wanderers who would sometimes stumble upon the town quite by accident, yet be so enthralled by all the natural beauty on offer that they just have to spend a night at the only hotel in town, the Woodsman's Lodge, run by my friend Andreas. That's what we thought they were at first, just visitors. That's why we welcomed them when they arrived, because not one of us had any idea who these people really were, what they really were. We could have never known that they had chosen our town specifically. They had come here on purpose. Many of the warrior among our town thought these newcomers were strange. They were a group of five, very obviously full of cash, but less obvious was their reasons for coming here. When friendly townsfolk try to drum up conversation with any of them, they all seemed to report the same thing, that these strangers were aloof, and each one gave a dramatically different answer as to why they had come to our quiet little logging community. One said their group was just sightseeing, another said they had gotten lost. Someone else from their group told a local man that they were here on a mission from someone called Karsist Varus, and was rumored to have been quickly silenced by another in the visitor's party. But the one thing they all seemingly agreed on was that they wouldn't be any trouble. They insisted on that, in fact, and said that the five of them were just looking for somewhere to sleep, bed and board, in exchange for cash. And so, someone pointed them in the direction of Andreas's hotel. I was often there myself, not as a guest, but helping my friend maintain the place. He'd inherited the hotel from his family, but it was always in need of repair. Luckily, my background was in carpentry, and I was more than happy to help Andreas out. It wasn't one of your fancy furnished hotels, you know, the kind you'd find in a big city, all slick and sleek and owned by a big chain. It was homely, a more bed and breakfast type of place. It was, anyway. Whenever I was working over at the Woodsman's, I'd observed the strange group of visitors from a distance. They didn't seem to me like average tourists or sightseers. To me, they looked wealthy, very wealthy. It wasn't hard to picture any one of them as a politician or a businessman. The way they dressed and carried themselves made it pretty clear they were people of influence. Of course, that begged the question, what on earth were people like that doing in a town like this? I first got to speak with one of them after a few days. The five newcomers were down a man, and didn't seem at all happy about that. The remaining four were grumpy, looking angered and agitated. I wondered if maybe their fifth compatriot had left in the night, but when I asked around town, apparently nobody had seen him. Unless he's crazy and decided to hike through the woods on his own in the middle of the night. One of my friends scoffed, after telling me that no one had even heard any cars leaving the night before. I decided to ask one of the visitors when he passed me in the hallway of the woodsman's lodge, trying to broach the topic as tactfully as I could. Sorry to see you're down a man, I told him. He stopped in his tracks, like i just caught him doing something he shouldn't be. Yes, yes, he replied, not turning around to face me. It is a terrible shame, a terrible shame indeed. But he had to leave us. It was for his own good. He knew that. We all did. Following that odd encounter, things got all the stranger the following day. I arrived at the woodsman's again, expecting to start another day of work. I'd gotten a call from Andreas earlier that morning. He was complaining about some kind of squelching noise coming from the basement under the hotel. That had only started last night. I told him I wasn't a plumber, but that I'd take a look. So imagine my surprise when I saw Andreas loading most of his worldly possessions up into a truck outside of the front of the hotel. He excitedly explained to me that he'd been bought out that the remaining four newcomers had offered to buy the woodsman's on the spot. But that's your family's hotel, Andreas, I reminded him, as if it was already too late. I was never going to keep it afloat forever, he shrugged. When they told me how much they were willing to pay, I couldn't refuse. I would have done the same, Ingvar. I've never been offered so much money. This all made it very clear. These guests were here to stay. It had taken less than a week for me to grow suspicious of these people. It wasn't in my nature to pry, but so much about them just didn't make any sense. They were clearly rich enough to buy Andreas's hotel like it was nothing. 
just like an ordinary everyday purchase, like buying a loaf of bread. But they were far too insular to seemingly want to run a hotel for our friendly logging town. It left me scratching my head over the whole thing, making the question of what they were really up to stick out like an unignorable splinter. Were these just careless rich folk with more money than sense? Had they somehow grown disillusioned with their wealthy, affluent lifestyles, and were now using this hotel to learn how to connect with people on a more fulfilling personal level? Or did they have a different agenda? Something else that they were trying to hide? It turns out, they did. I decided to formally introduce myself to the new owners of the Woodsman's. After all, I knew this place well. It always needed something repaired. Plus, if I could keep my little side job of working there as a handyman going, then maybe I could find out exactly what they were doing. I was greeted by the man I'd spoken briefly to the other day, looking at me with a scowl as I stood in the doorway. Hello, sir, I greeted warmly, met with silence. Uh, we, uh, we, we met the other day? What do you want? Oh, well, um, I continued, disarmed by the bluntness. I, I understand your group just bought this place. I had a gentleman's agreement with the last owner. I'd help him out, fix things that need fixing. I, I just thought I should offer the same service to you if you'd be interested. Might help get this hotel up and running nice and quick for you, so you can start making a return on your investment. With that, the door was unceremoniously slammed in my face. At first, it certainly seemed like my options for uncovering more about this strange group were all but depleted, or at least doing so through any legitimate means. But just as I was reaching a desperate point where I was considering donning a balaclava and breaking into the hotel in the dead of night, opportunity re-emerged from behind that closed door. We were sorry to turn you away yesterday. One of the other visitors apologized somewhat insincerely, but we would be delighted to take you up on your offer, provided you accept a few. Conditions. Conditions? I echoed. What would those be? We would need you to start on repairs immediately. We want to open up the hotel's doors to guests in the next few days as a matter of urgency, he explained. But you will need to be discreet. Privacy is very important to us, so we hope to maintain that for our guests. It all seemed like a lot of hoops to jump through. Certainly more than Andreas had ever given me when he used to run the Woodsman's. But it felt like the right call, if at least it got me closer to answers. In hindsight, I should have turned them down. Over the course of the next week, things seemed to run relatively normally. I'd be given a checklist of things to fix around the hotel, and for the most part just focus purely on the tasks at hand. But whenever the strange new owners were near, I'd try to subtly listen in on their conversations. They seemed to mostly talk about running the hotel though, like they knew I was around. A few tourists started showing up, in fact. It seemed to get much busier than usual pretty quickly. I asked one of the odd owners about it, and he just brushed it off as the result of their group's marketing the Woodsman's Lodge more widely on the internet. I didn't see much of the hotel's guests staying out of their way as I'd been instructed to, but it did strike me as odd how few of them seemed to leave. Some I spotted around town, usually those traveling as a couple or in a larger group. Any that were staying alone, though, they didn't seem to venture beyond the Woodsman's. None of them checked out, either. But their rooms would be empty and often needing repairs, mainly scratch marks on the wooden floorboards. Two and a half weeks after that weird group had arrived and bought up my friend's hotel, I got a call from someone I knew who lived next door to the Woodsman's. The hotel! Someone was screaming! She said frantically over the line. Get her quick, they might need you! I checked the time. It was the dead of night, so late that it was almost the start of the next day. Racing quickly over to the hotel, I was greeted by one of the owners. He had rushed to the door wide awake like he hadn't even been sleeping. When I told him there were reports of blood-curdling screams, he reprimanded me. You were told our guest's privacy must be maintained, he scolded. If you must know, one of the hikers staying with us tripped over and had a nasty fall. He landed downstairs in the basement, and he's in a lot of pain not to be moved. We've already called for an ambulance. I wanted to take what he said at face value, but the fact he wouldn't let me see the injured man felt suspicious. I spent the night with the person who lived next door to the hotel, watching the woodsman's lodge for any sign of ambulance. It never arrived. That was when I remembered. He had said the guest fell into the basement, the same basement Andreas had heard a strange squelching coming from, and not once had these new owners asked me to take a look down there. Already, I was even further suspicious of the new owners now. I had no idea what they were up to. The wild theories in my head ranged from them being a group of sadistic serial killers using the hotel to lure victims, or a shadowy government black ops team up to something nefarious. Enough was enough. I needed answers. I couldn't wait for an opportunity. I had to create one. While as few people were in the hotel as possible, I snuck into the main office. Not to steal anything or even peek just yet, but break the legs off a desk 
If they asked me to fix it, then I would be able to spend longer in the office with no supervision. Sure enough, they soon asked me if I'd be able to fix the desk, and that was my way in. I started rummaging through the filing cabinets, rifling through whatever I could find. Old expense reports, legal documents left behind by Andreas, but there was nothing that could give me any inkling as to what was actually going on, until there was. You see, as much as it came as a surprise to no one more than me, I wasn't the only one looking into this new, strange group. One of the guests entered the office and quickly realized what he was doing. At first, he seemed to imply that I was somehow in a league with the new owners, but I was able to talk him around, telling him I was just trying to get to the bottom of what they were up to. That was when he revealed to me who he was. Agent Clarkson, he introduced himself. I'm here on behalf of the SCP Foundation. After he brought me up to speed on what the hell all that meant, we arranged to reconvene somewhere they wouldn't overhear us, meeting up at the lumber mill. He explained that these four strangers were a cult, a subsect of a strange religion I had never heard of called Sarcasism. But after Agent Clerickson described their practices, I wouldn't soon forget. Ritualistic sacrifices, cannibalism, and even far, far worse than that. It made me feel sick just hearing about it. Over the next few days, Clerickson agreed to let me help in his investigation, offering me the chance to help the Foundation and make it so that nobody in my remote little logging town would ever have to suffer the memory of what the Sarkic cult were up to. Little did I realize, he also meant me. I did my best to spy on the death and disease-worshipping cultists without drawing too much suspicion, and reported my findings back to the Foundation agent, but it quickly became clear that he was unimpressed with my current method of just eavesdropping, so instead he suggested a more direct approach. Clerickson gave me a book on the Sarkic religion, telling me to memorize as much as I could, and then approach the cultists as if I shared in their twisted beliefs. Even reading the techniques of Grand Carcist Ion was enough to make my stomach turn. All the grotesque things that the founder of this cult's beliefs preached in order to achieve something akin to godhood? It was horrific. What was much more horrific, though, was that our plan went awry. I asked to speak alone with one of the cultists, and instantly started explaining that I have observed them for a time, and I come to realize that we were one and the same. In a state of panic, I regurgitated anything I could still remember from reading about sarcasism. Their goal to achieve apotheosis through will, the consumption of gods, and sacrifice. But I must have said something wrong. One of them stuck up behind me and knocked me unconscious. I woke up in a daze, a splitting headache running through my skull. I was in a cage, in a part of the hotel I hadn't seen before. It was dark, absent of natural light. There were others too. I recognized one or two of the hotel's single guests, also trapped in cages. Agent Clerkson was nowhere to be found. The Sarkic cultists spent the next day asking me how I had found them. I told them the truth, and answered their questions the only way I knew how, but I couldn't make them believe me. Liar! One spat. You did your homework, I'll admit. But the Foundation is known for working in broad strokes, missing out on the finer details. We're neo sarkites another explained. You were spouting the teachings of the proto sarkic religion. We believe the only way of becoming a god, achieving the apotheosis, is through sheer will. And in terms of sacrifice, one of the other cultists chimed in, We'll sacrifice many in service of us few, but you'll soon come to witness more of that. They kept me in the cage for days, without food and barely any water. I felt so drained of energy before long, and I soon realized why no one had heard the captive guests calling out for help. They were so weak that they could barely gather enough strength to shout, and those that did, their voices were too weak to reach anyone above the basement. The cultists came and went all throughout the day, alternating between running the woodsman's lodge and coming down into the dark, cramped, and disgusting room below. The stench was foul, yet not one of the Sarkic cultists seemed to mind. They would just talk endlessly about the new age of flesh before dragging their next victim out of their cage at night and taking them into a back room. By this point, all the remaining hotel guests that had been caged up with me were gone. I could never fully see what went on in the other room, but I certainly heard a lot. There were muffled screams followed by chanting in a language I didn't understand. Then came the noise of something slithering, all the while the cultists who had gathered in the room with their captive victim kept reciting their incantations. I had no idea what was going on in there, but the hotel guests never re-emerged, just the Sarkites. I'd read enough about their rituals to get a pretty good idea. I'd lost track of how long I'd been prisoner when Agent Clerkson appeared in the basement. The cultist's backs have been turned just long enough for him to slip downstairs undetected. For a moment, I thought I was saved, only for my heart to sink when he told me he couldn't get me out. 
I pleaded with him, but he insisted that he needed to know exactly what was going on down here. As he left me on my own, I cursed him under my breath. Before much long, the cultists decided it was my turn. They dragged me out of my cage and into the back room, strapping me to a chair. I had no strength to fight back, but I had plenty of fear. There were more cages back here. It was an old storeroom that they were now keeping nightmares in. The things in the cages were disgusting abominations, masses of bloody, gooey flesh, flesh that had once been human. I realized these were the hotel guests, the ones who traveled alone, who never checked out, whose fingernails had left scratches on the floorboards as they were dragged out of the rooms by the cultists. Using a cattle prod, one of the Sarkites started directing a creature towards me. The horrible mutant was getting closer, an appendage resembling an arm reaching out at me. It was going to turn me into one of them, and I couldn't stop it. Scared for my life, I mustered the little energy I had left to try and pull away from the sickening creature. But just as it was about to make contact, someone kicked down the door. Agent Clarkson had returned with reinforcements, members of a mobile task force that promptly arrested the Sarkic cultists and sealed the room containing the monsters for the time being. He sat down next to me and explained what had gone on but I was barely awake enough to keep up with all the details. Something about SCP-610 instances and rare to see them this far out of Siberia, but he promised that the SCP Foundation would be ordering the creatures to be incinerated soon. The Woodsman's Lodge would have to be burned down as part of the cover story. As for me, I just want to forget the whole ordeal. The Sarkic cult, all the people they turned into monsters, the horrifying things they do, the SCP-610s, all of it. I want it all gone. Luckily, Agent Clarkson has given me something he says will help with that. He called it an amnestic. Want an anomaly of your own? Check out scpswag.com for high quality SCP merch. Now go check out what does this secret SCP religion believe in? And I survived 100 days hiding from the SCP Foundation. Here's what happened for more mysterious SCP offerings.